Hi, welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to first introduce you to Prince Yemisi Shilon. And next to me also is Bruce Campbell Scott. Um, the reason for this talk is to talk about two very different but very, very um, similar collections in a way that they both have been collecting um, works from their own country. Bruce is from South Africa, Prince Shilon is from Nigeria from the 1970s. Both collections tell a really interesting in-depth story of how the modern art is, is transformed in both countries. And it also, in a kind of subconscious way, looks at the political context of pre-apartheid South Africa, but also what was going on within politically upheaval of, of government in Nigeria from the 19, say, the 1966 to 1999. And um, what we're going to look at is how they both um, started collecting and how over the years they've transformed the collection. Um, Prince Shilin's collection goes from about 1932 to to 2015, and there's about over 7,000 works. Bruce's, it started in 1920, it goes to about 1990. He doesn't collect anymore, but there's about 600 works. Both are very specific. They're based in Africa. Um, Bruce collectors primarily black South African artists who were marginalized at that time, and Prince Shillen collected Nigerian artists. So both collectors living in their own countries collecting works which are on the continent. Um, what I'm going to do at the moment is go through, a f uh, give you a kind of a little clips of, of works from Bruce's collection and then look at Prince Shillan's collection and then we're going to do a Q&A about how it all began, the journeys. Um, this um, uh, work Bruce was telling me earlier was from the 1920s, late 20s, late 20s was one of the first work, early works in his collection. Right way? This isn't working. Am I supposed to be going up or down? Oh, there it is. Backwards? I'm going to go through this quite quickly uh, so you can kind of get an idea. Sorry about this. It's yeah, there. I'll start talking because it doesn't seem to be. <laughs> work in a minute. So I'll start us off. Um, um, Prince Shilon, you, you started collecting in the 1970s. Um, can you tell us about how, what the first thing, you, how this came about and what was the, one of the first works or how you were even introduced into the idea of art in, in Nigeria? Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, first of all, I can draw. I draw very well. I drew up to class three in the secondary school. Then I went into sciences. I became an engineer. But while I was in the university, I was reading in a school where art was being offered, at Yaba College of Tech. And in their library, I used to see, I mean, in their library, behind their library was the student demonstration center. And that's how I got this uh, inspiration to start collecting. So I started collecting as an undergraduate in the university, uh, which has spanned over the years now I still collect. I collected uh, two days before leaving uh, Nigeria. What, I mean, what, were the, what was the first kind of work that you actually bought? Two stylized uh, uh, sculptural pieces from a student in the Yaba College of Tech then. Those are my f first two works I bought. And do you, Bruce, yours is a slightly different story because you technically had no access to the artists you ended up collecting, which were black South African artists. Um, so how did you discover them and you know how did you go about finding them in a, in a sense? Well, I, I, studied, I studied fine arts yeah. at university 
<coughs> and a visiting exhibition was brought down of sculptures from the rural parts of South Africa. In those days, there were little satellite Bontustans, they called them, <coughs> Gazankulu, Labowa, and Venda. And I was very excited about the art because it was dissimilar to anything that I had ever seen. And it had come out of traditions <coughs> in the rural areas. And um, so I traveled up to... And it was easy to go from Johannesburg and just and basically walk anywhere or go anywhere to find these artists? Well, we had, we, had, we had a car and we drove into these areas and we went to the villages, we met the artists <coughs> and um, I acquired certain works. I mean, with the, why weren't these artists on, on, on the main system, as I said, just they, partly due to apartheid? They existed right out of the mainstream. Yeah, and one thing that was interesting you mentioned was that most of the artists were, were, were untrained, so they, they couldn't go to art school, and if they did go to art school, they were missionary schools. I mean, what was, how, how did that change throughout your, in terms of your collection, in terms of how, when did it start becoming trained, or has it always been a mixture of the both? Well, a lot of the early works, I'm not talking sculpture, were by artists who didn't have the opportunity of any kind of formal art education at all. And yet they became competent in the medium of, let's say, watercolor like we saw earlier, and within a Western canon. So, <clears throat> but it was not incorporated into an art historical context and was not collected by, by institutions in yeah, the country. Yeah, which is in Nigeria is, was a completely different story because most of the artists you were collecting were completely trained, but under Western influence, but were, were probably up until the 19, I guess, 60s. Can you tell us a bit more about the transition from being trained with Western influence and then and then going back to post-colonial and um, post-independence, post-colonial Africa and Nigeria? How that changed in terms of the artists and also what you, what you saw in the change? Well, um, my collection uh, goes as far as the ninth century, the Uboku, and in in historical pattern, uh, Nigerian art was more into sculpting traditional art, you know, the Benin, the Uboku, the Ife, and so on. And um, when you talk about modern art, um, the first trained Nigerian uh, modern artist was Aino Nobulu. And um, I think I showed one of the works in 1932. One. And um, when Aino Nobulu, Aino Nobulu used to train children in schools, mm -hmm. and he invited Kenneth Murray to Nigeria. And Kenneth Buru trained people like uh, um, uh, Benny mm -hmm. and then there was there was formal training in Yaba College of Tech, which was founded in the late forties. Training artists, and some of the students were moved to Amadou Bello University, which is, and they formed what they now call the Zaria Rebel, mm -hmm. which is people like Bruce Onobakpaya, Simon Okeke, Osadibe, Mwagbara, and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, uh, Yusuf Grillo, mm -hmm. and then it moved from there into from Zaria Art School. I mean, we now have graduates of Zaria Art School forming the Uli Art School, the, the Honor School of Art, the um, Auchi School of Art, and so on and so forth. Nigeria now has about 100 school, uh, tertiary institutions made up of university and polytechnics producing artists. So we have, I have the collections of all the various schools of art, you know, right from Aina Nobolu to date. Yeah, and what I, what I was also interested in and how you, you put together the collections, because Bruce, you were saying that you, there, has to be a, there had to be a context of what you were looking for at the certain periods and how you filled it out, the collection, in terms of whatever story was being told, in terms of whatever techniques. And how, how did that come about? What were you looking for? What, what were you trying to portray? What vision of, of, of black South Africa were you trying to convey? I just, I just took notice of works having been <coughs> at art school and having st studied uh, art history, of, of works that I had never encountered before because they actually existed outside of the register. And I started collecting works to slowly sort of introduce them, as it were, into uh, a fine arts con context. Mm -hmm. 
And um, <clears throat> most of the artists that I collected had never really been acknowledged at all. Uh, they were not collected by the major institutions, museums, and art galleries. <clears throat> and it was only later in the 80s <clears throat> that they first started receiving some acknowledgement in the way of uh, an exhibition called The Neglected Tradition at the Johannesburg Art Gallery. <clears throat> and um, I encountered artists that I'd never heard of in my life works that I'd never seen, I took an interest and started concentrating on collecting those works with the intention someday of having a collection that could be integrated. As a whole, as a whole picture. Correct. And, and with you, um, Prince Shilon, you, you were, what, I, what I love about um, the, the way you've done it is that it, it also highlights various stages of, of Nigerian art history in the fact of, as well as what was going on politically. So in politically in the sense of art in art, so the Zion art movement, the Oshobo school, you pretty much have a, you have a concise, you've, the way you've put the collection together has been very concise. Was that methodical or did you start at one point saying you bought, I don't know, say El Natsu at one point and then you went back to the, to the Oshobo school? Did you go, then go to the Zion school or was it, how did that come about? So no, actually, when I started, I had no canon at all. I was just collecting. But it got to a stage where I began to put my collection together, looking at the lacuna in, in the Nigerian art history, uh, trying to fill those works I do not have in, within, the Niger, within the context of the Nigerian mm -hmm. art history. Mm -hmm. That's how I developed, you know, eventually, a kind of historical uh, you know, um, collection. Of, of art based on Nigerian art history. So um, at any point in time, like the El Nasri, for instance, uh, I think sometime in the, in the 90s, I found the El Nasri, you know, being sold, and I bought it to fill that gap. You know, I had Bruce and Abakpaya, Simon. So as I collect, I try to fill in those historical gaps because there are, um, the, the history of Nigerian art is, is well known to me, and I, I easily and, can, yeah. can, can and, feel but how, the, the how were you going about it in a sense? Was it because the, the, there was no gallery system at that point? So was it you finding, how, how were you going about to finding these artists working? And what are the most interesting things that we were talking about earlier today was the fact that um, unlike, say, Bruce, a lot of the artists that you were collecting were, were also leaving because of what was going on in, in Africa, in Nigeria at the time, in the 1990s. And you, then you mentioned to me, because a lot of people were leaving, you were acquiring work for very affordably because they were leaving their work behind. Can you just, can you just highlight this a bit more? Well, by, by 1991, 1992, um, I found myself with a large amount of Nigerian art, you know. And then I, during the Abacha regime, there was a head of state of Nigeria in the military era. He was very nasty and a lot of people, foreigners who had collected Nigerian art, were living in Nigeria. And at that time, the value of Nigerian art did not mean much. I mean, you could buy an El Anasui for about $1,000 equivalent today. And so they were just throwing it away because it didn't have much value you know, outside Nigeria. So I bought a lot at that time during that political period. You remember the time Ken, Ken Sarwiwa was uh, murdered by the Abacha regime. That was a time when a lot of works were bought by me. Also, um, the estate of, um, of past collectors who had died. Many of the family members, we did not really know the value of these collections, like uh, Ashamu, for instance, the late Ashamu, the late uh, Jide Maye, the family system did not. So I bought many of those works through such family. And also the estate of artists like Aino Nobolu. I bought some from the estate of Aino Nobolu and you know, over time, I've had relationship with the family, the estate of uh, Akin Lashekon, and so on. So I bought through galleries. There were galleries. Um, okay. You know, there were people, uh, galleries like uh, Treasure House was my main buyer. I bought a lot of Ben Osawe. Uh, I bought my Rabo Emokpai from Treasure House Gallery, and so on and so forth. So there were, there were galleries. It was only in the, in the 19, late 1990s that when I had auction houses, that came and, it came, yeah. and of course, we started buying from auction houses. 
and uh, we had the art house coming up in 2008. I bought some works through art house, and then we had works uh, purchased through uh, Terraculture, my dream auction houses. Okay. So there were so many galleries, and of course, that's how I put my collection together. Let's, let's go back a bit and just talk about some of the artists per personally in your collection. One thing that I, I wanted to know, especially from Bruce's side, is that when, when you were working or, or acquiring works, how, what was the position emotionally of these artists? I mean, how, how would they even, I mean, they were obviously aware of what was going on, but were they aware of even the, 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 the was there an intense scene at, at that time we, we, amongst the artists? Because with, or were they even, you know, mixing with the broader South African art scene, or was it completely operated separately? I mean, even it, even to the extent of in some of the some of the some of the works and how they were conveyed in, in what they were conveying and how, how that situation how the political situation of the time was 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 being portrayed by what they were doing. There were two art schools um, opened and they existed simultaneously in Johannesburg. One was in the Midlands in um, Natal, and it was started by Swedish missionaries, and it was called Rorks. Drift. In Rourke's Drift, Swedish teachers introduced students to graphic media, etching, liner cuts, and other things like that. And so <clears throat> it provided them the experience, and they were given the materials to be able to <coughs> work in relatively sophisticated media at their time. And the other one was Poly Street in Johannesburg, which was more city-based. And a lot of artists studied there and later became teachers there. And so people, for example, like Kumalo, who is a well-known uh, sculptor, <coughs> started at Poly Street. That was in the 60s. In the 60s, yeah. yeah. And then, ha but how, in a sense, w were they as, as, as in operation? W was, was, there a, was there a mixture of, of, of artists being together or aware of each other's works? Were you collecting them individually of each other? Or, you know, how, how was one linking with the other? <clears throat> when one starts collecting, one doesn't actually realize that one is in the process of collecting. <laughs> And after a while, one starts seeing the synergy between the works, and one starts to construct what I did, some sort of narrative that will tell a story of the development of oh. art outside of, as it were, the mainstream uh, whatever. Mainstream art, art. world or world. Uh, so <clears throat> it was quite ironical in South Africa that you had something called South African art, and then you had something called township art. Now, <clears throat> how can you have two art from the same country? So at some point in time, you know, art had to become integrated because it can really only be one South African art. And <clears throat> the artists that were never acknowledged and the works that were never collected need to be incorporated into basically a whole new, new museum context in South Africa that still doesn't exist. Which is going to uh, Prince, in your situation in, in Nigeria, there, there was, uh, the art scene generally was Nigerian artists, but also was quite very much um, different to what was going on, or say, very much ignored. How, 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 do you, how did you feel about that? I mean, were you, were you the only ones doing it, or were there other people alongside you? Well, before, I, there were people who are collecting art, you know, in Nigeria. I mean, people like uh, Oli Zambu, who is late now. People like uh, Adi, Professor Adi Uyelambu, who was the director general of the World Health Organization. He was a collector. Uh, people like Jide Mayo, Maye, that I mentioned, was a collector. There, are, there were other collectors. The family of uh, Maja Kudumi, they are, they are collectors. The late Maja Kudumi, the founder of St. Nicholas Hospital, uh, they are collectors. They have been collectors before, before me, and they are collectors even now. Um, but the, the beauty of my collection is the, is the widespread nature of it, you know. 
Um, it's the one spot in Nigeria where you can see all spectrum of Nigerian art, both um, traditional art, modern art, contemporary art, photography, name it, conceptual art, you know. So there are other collectors and there were people that were collecting, but the, the, the but major... When these moments were going on for you that you were collecting, say, look, let's look at, say, the Zaire, the Zaire Art Society, was it well known at the time or was it a very underground movement? This is probably what I'm trying to say in terms oh. like the Nsuka school. Was it, pop was it a popular movement or were you just finding it out yourself naturally or even were you even around at that time or was it an, a pre, you know, an afterthought that came together between you, you discovered something else? No, let's get it straight. This, this idea of Zaria, Zaria school, yeah. Archie school, they are products of uh, art historians. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, they are products of art students. They are not really not. A, a, a community or a collection okay. of artists. They are, they are a product of art students. Like, you know, the Honor School of Art, you know, it's um, an exhibition took place in Ife, in University of Ife, where people like Campbell, people like Tolawewe. Oh, in uh, terms of the workshops Moyo, in Oshobo. Moyo Gidiji, Moyo Kediji, um, 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 Moyo Ugundikwe and so. They form the, the, the Honor School of Art, and you take the Zaria Art School. So it's, they are creations of art historians. But what, what we're saying is that the different so-called art historian schools of art, because Nigeria has a well-developed um, tertiary institution of uh, producing artists, and we have different clusters in terms of historical clusters of uh, of uh, modern and, artists. And what would you think that the artists at the time, what were their primary primary influences in terms of what was going on in the country, in terms of some of them would have had different training backgrounds, but what did you feel when you, when you were acquiring work? What was their primary objective? What were they trying to convey? Was it a political thing? Was it a social thing? Was, was it just an art thing? They were just doing what they wanted to do? Uh, as against the situation in South Africa, our, our artists were not really, apart from Akiolala Shekon, Akiolala Shekon, who is the second pioneer Nigerian artist, who played a very major role in terms of the, the decolonization of Nigeria, because he worked with uh, our first uh, governor general, uh, Dr. Azikiwe. He was a cartoonist, he was also a, an artist, you know, a visual artist. Yeah, he played a role because he played a major role in terms of being cartoonist in the West African pilot that led the um, independence of Nigeria. So that's one man that played a very major role. And then you have people like Professor Jegere, who is just retired from the University of Miami, in, uh, in uh, Ohio, he was a cartoonist and also mm -hmm. a painter. Mm -hmm. So we have some, 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 some number of Nigerian artists that played some major political roles. And those ones are different from the normal flow of Nigerian artists. They just produce their works based on, you know, their very various creative abilities, compositions, and so on and so forth. And what it, for you was, was the most attractive blocks? Was, was, it the, was it the political natures of the work? Was it just the materials? Was it just filling the gaps in the collection? I mean, what essence were you looking for? Well, I think I started, like I said, mere interest in art, yeah. in collecting art. And then with time, it became a passion and obsession. And when it gets to a passion and obsession, um, you begin to want to rationalize your passion and obsession. You want to pragmatize whatever you're doing. So at that stage of uh, rationality, that's when you begin to say, okay, I want to fill in this gap, this, this is missing in my collection, yeah. that is missing in my collection. Because you mentioned before that it started off with sculpture, and then with Bruce, yours is primarily painting. And it's quite interesting how these two convey. I mean, can you explain why yours is sculpture and then yours is painting, in a sense? Well, I have some sculpture. A little bit, yeah. <coughs> Sculpture is not so easy to store <laughs> or, or move around. And so <clears throat> I'm trying to concentrate more on two-dimensional works, paintings, drawings, and prints. Um, one has to bear in mind that <clears throat> in pioneer times, the artists didn't really have access you know, to sophisticated mediums like oil and canvas. And so a lot of them drew, or did liner cuts, or did uh, prints and multiples. What's also interesting is that you, there are a few artists, not just from South Africa in the collection. You also were looking at just as Zimbabwe. <laughs> <laughs> and is it Botswana as well? 
<laughs> can, can, I'm just talking about the logistics of where you were. So in the sense, were, these, uh, were there these artists in South Africa at the time, or were you move, being able to move around to see these works? <clears throat> no, no, I, I saw the works in South Africa. In South Africa. So a Namibian artist like John Mofungejo, who Dura once described, uh, sorry, who... Um, Some art critic, Clement Greenberg, oh, okay. said he was the most important graphic artist since Dura, which was quite, quite a claim to make. So he came and studied at Rourke's Drift on two different occasions. I mean, uh, did you think about going further out than just South Africa? Or were you, were you, were you primarily just concerned with what was going on in the country? I was concentrating on South African art history. Uh, that was uh, important for me to be able to actually put together a reasonably concise and um, reflective collection. And the MSC for you, did, did you think about moving out of your demographic or was it something that you, you were completely, um, you wanted to completely convey the entire Nigerian art history in one collection rather than say it's, it's a vast continent, but I was saying were you drawn to any other things going on around you? So um, I was very lucky at a very early age, I became a director of a multinational company and I, it involved traveling around the world. And so I started with West Africa. I, ex I set up a, an export desk in my multinational company where I was a director. Uh, so I was exporting to Ghana, Togo, um, uh, Cameroon, and so on. So I, I had cost to do feasibility studies to establish you know, various uh, relationship between our company and uh, the West African country. So I ended up collecting works of people like Professor Tete, Abladi Glover, uh, people like um, uh, Raymond Kotei, the late Raymond Kotei, and so on and so forth. I collected the uh, Hayi of Togo. I collected um, uh, Ludovic Fadairo in, um, in Benin Republic. And then, of course, I had cause to go to South Africa. I collected Mudaraki. You know, I collected... Uh, of recently, so, and so I have, and again I've gone on cruises around the world, and you know the West African, um, the West we, uh, Westminster Auction House, they, they, they do a lot of um, auctions in in the cruise ship. So I've had cause to co collect some works like Salvador Dali, um, people like um, Simon Bull, and so on and so forth. So my collection goes beyond um, Nigeria. Nigeria. You know, it, it's it's well very widespread. Um, one interesting thing is, is Bruce, you, you don't collect anymore. You stopped in 1990. <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, I, I feel that I've, I've accomplished something. There is a, a sort of foundation that can be built on. And um, <clears throat> it's, there are budgetary constraints. And, it, um, is, is it so, I mean, what is, what is so different I guess, what is so different for you now in terms of the art world or the art scene in South Africa to what, 20 years ago, how different? Or do you not like what's going on at the moment? I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> but I was more important, it was more important for me to actually put together the heritage context <clears throat> that really had not, didn't Being really, it, it, didn't, it didn't exist. Yeah. So up until, you know, the early 90s. Because you, you stop at, what, 1990? So you stopped four years before the end of apartheid. It's quite an interesting, yeah. I was wondering. Look, I still do collect a few, <laughs> a few yeah. things. But I don't really have the budget to buy it's, con it's contemporary. Um, and I think that, that the collection can grow going forward. But... Um, Someone in terms else of works from the past or works from the future, adding works, works from the past. Works from the future. Yeah. Yeah. So there, you know, there, there, there are a whole, a whole lot of young um, <coughs> artists who who do have access now to uh, institutions. Since 1994, mm -hmm. uh, the whole scenario has uh, has changed. Mm -hmm. No, I understand. And you, Yemisi, you, you're, still, you're still collecting. How different is it what you're acquiring works now to say what you were acquiring 20 years ago in the sense of it must have been different in, if you look at photography, sculpture, the, the whole thing with video, installation. How has the collection changed in the last, in the last 
10 years for you? Well, in the last 10 years, I would say that um, I have uh, more or less gone into um, photography in terms of documenting Nigeria's fast disappearing uh, uh, cultural festivals. I think in 2009, I had to um, arrange with a photographer in-house under my foundation to get accredited to cover uh, cultural festivals that are dying out as a result of increasing urbanization in Nigeria. And some of these festivals, uh, and then of course, as a result of uh, um, uh, religion, you know, Western religion, um, destroying some of these cultural values uh, in terms of some. So I think in terms of photography and videoing of our cultural festivals, yes, there has been a change. Now in terms of collection of uh, modern art, I think I have been more, um, I've concentrated more in building um, the imagined artist. Of the imagined today. artist. Yeah. And also using I mean, my collection. How has this changed? So, I mean, are you buying? Are you buying new mediums? Are you buying video? Are you buying? What are you buying? What would you say is dramatically changing your buying habit that you would never have thought of in say ten years ago? Well, I I don't buy photography. I don't buy photographs. You didn't buy. Oh, I don't. Okay. I create. I create the photographs okay. myself. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like I explained, uh, that's the way I create it. In terms of um, sculptural works, yes, I still buy. I mean, uh, people like Ulu Amoda, for instance, uh, who is a major um, uh, international uh, artist from Nigeria, people like Adeola Balogun, and so on. I still I commissioned them to do works. In fact, the, the work uh, that I unveiled at the University of Lagos about uh, five days ago, where I donated to the university uh, a major uh, sculptural piece of 15 feet high in bronze, I commissioned an artist to do it. So my, my attitude now, I mean, my collection now, is more towards creating a legacy, you know, my, a legacy for myself. No, I was gonna, I was gonna come up with the, mm. to say that both of the collections have a very time capsule quality to them, and what what becomes of of, of all these works? You've you've stopped now. So wh where are most of the works? Are they in storage? Are they? Well, what will you do with them? Are you, are they on loans? There's, there's a slight misunderstanding. Here. <laughs> I have collected. And I still do collect, yeah. but I collect works up until 1990. Okay. Yeah. So that, you know, that is my particular field and what I concentrate on. So, um, you know, I have bought works this year, I bought works last year, but seldom do I buy works that are. Oh. Older than 1990. But what will um, what will happen all the, all these works? What what do you plan to do with them? <laughs> it remains to be seen. It's uh, you know it's um, I'm a temporary custodian. Um, unfortunately, you know, the Department of Cultural Affairs and the South African government have shown very little interest in heritage, and so the works have not, as it were, been incorporated into like the National Gallery or any of the, the museums. So, um, I guess, you know, <clears throat> I mean, li like you many, yeah. I will probably establish an art foundation to make sure that the collection is kept together for posterity. And at some time, maybe someone will come forward and build a building and <clears throat> put it together a collection of South African art that is truly representative of all our cultures. One thing I wanted to ask, actually, just slightly going back, was you know the majority of your artists you were collecting at the time were completely marginalised. But now, are, are these artists being taught at school, at art schools in South Africa? Sorry, I can't hear uh, you. Are the artists that you are the artists in your collection now being taught at school in South Africa for the next generation of of, of artists, or just in general? Well, mo most of the artists in my collection. Or, de or deceased. Yeah, but are the are the his, art history being taught of their work? <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing. <laughs> it's almost a way of me saying that you, you you spent years building this passion to document a part of history, and I would want to know if this history is being continued elsewhere in some kind of edu vocal education, or is it still just in this collection? It should continue. Yeah. And so, but it's for someone else to take the baton yeah. and move forward. 
and then look at the work that has been done since 1990 and incorporate that as well. <coughs> uh, Prince Shillan, and you, what, what do you plan to do with over your, your 7,000 works? Well, um, to start with, I registered a foundation called Omobaya Misi Adidu in Shilon Art Foundation. It's called Oyasaf. It's on, you can Google it. Um, I've been engaged in a series of um, uh, promoting Nigerian um, art, you know, developing Nigerian art through schools competitions, through um, encouraging foreigners to come to Nigeria to do research, you know, based on my collection and the collections of others and institutions. I do... Um, I've donated works to public parks. Um, I've donated works to universities and so on and so forth. I'm engaged in promoting workshops in the University of Lagos. I'm engaged in many, many activities. But having said that, the collection um, has got to a point now where I have, I'm satisfied. On the, 12th of, uh, on the 10th of June this year, that is last week, I signed an agreement with uh, the Pan-Atlantic University in uh, Lagos. Um, to establish Nigeria's first privately funded public museum. Because there is nothing like that in Nigeria. We do not have any edifice exhibiting Nigerian modern art or contemporary art. So in my own, my, in my own collection, for instance, I'm ensu I've ensured a continuous legacy for myself because I've uh, put down the seed money, I've paid a significant amount of money to assist the university to build um, a museum called the Yemisi Shilon Museum Pan-Atlantic University. So I think I've, I've uh, already handled that. We're now just going to go to the audience and maybe take some questions for Bruce and Prince Shillon. Thank you. Hi, Bruce. I just wanted to ask you a question about, uh, you talked about uh, your collection, you collect marginalized black artists. But, but can you expand a bit on the artists from South Africa who went to the West and have perhaps been marginalized by the West themselves, such as Sikoto, maybe Dumile, who else you can think of? Well, very, very few. You've named uh, probably the most significant, Sikoto and Dumile. And <coughs> Um, they have, to a certain extent, been incorporated into the mainstream art register, particularly Sokoto, not so much uh, Dumile. Um, what else would you like me to uh, elaborate on? <laughs> I just think that uh, it's, it's interesting to see at the fair there's Dumile's contemporary, Melvin Edwards. He's being shown here. Um, it's a great shame that these artists are not being recognized outside of South Africa. Well it's, well, it's interesting to know that someone like William Kentridge was significantly influenced by Dumile when he was 13 years old and he saw Dumile's large charcoal drawings at Bill Ainsley's studio. He understood that charcoal on a large scale could become an effective fine art m medium. And um, I think that Dumile should be represented at Art Basel on fairs like this. But that is of obviously the prerogative of uh, dealers in terms of their own sort of predilections of, of what is significant in the way of contemporary art. Can I ask a question to Prince Yumissi? I see you largely collect artists who are working in, in Nigeria. What about the expat artists, the Chrysophiles and the Yinka Shoribaris? Do they not figure in your collection? Well, I make it a policy to promote indigenous Nigerian artists because I believe those are the people that are not really encouraged. They face a lot of challenges. Uh, the Chrysophiles of this world, the um, Angulus of this world, and so on and so forth. They have all the encouragement in the world, out there in the Western world. But the people in Nigeria, those artists in Nigeria are going through hell. I mean, power, power supply, lack of patronage, because there are few collectors in Nigeria. And so I make it a, a point of duty. The little resources available to me, I spend it on Nigerian artists based in Nigeria who are facing the challenges and who are more or less promoting the culture 
and uh, the the life, the way of life of, of Nigeria, rather than um, those who have um, been um, cross-pollinated by Western values and so on and so forth. So I, I make it a duty to collect Nigerian artists in Nigeria. I mean, just adding to that question, uh, that answer or question, is that a, a, what you'll find is a lot of artists in his collection actually left Nigeria in the 1990s to go across. But what they te what he tends to do, they tend to start off in, on in the country rather than being born out and then come in. Yeah, that's true because uh, that didn't occur to me. Um, the challenges Nigerian artists face is uh, can be explained by you know artists like Zakaya Salon Toba, a major artist who has his work in the Atlanta uh, airport, the Art Artfield Airport in, Atlant in uh, Atlanta. He had to leave Nigeria to become a taxi driver. After some time, he ran a restaurant, and then he died. Um, also, we have um, artists like Twin 77, famous Twin 77, when he couldn't, he couldn't, he didn't get much patronage in Nigeria. He had to leave Nigeria um, to, to drive taxi. There are many, many Nigerian artists who are not finding patronage, who are finding things difficult to survive in Nigeria. So I think it's my duty as um, one of the leaders uh, of Nigerian art in development, Nigerian art development, to encourage those artists. So I spend my scarce resources in uh, encouraging those number of Nigerian, indigenous Nigerian artists instead of allowing them to go and become mug, mug operators, drivers, or chefs, and they lose that creativity. Um, which they are endowed with. That's why I concentrate on, on Nigerian artists in Nigeria. Um, I, I would like to, to, I already have a microphone oh, here. Oh, sorry, so he has a question here. Yeah. If you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, start by applauding your, your efforts um, in, in building up collections uh, wherever they are in Nigeria and in South Africa. So I would start by saying that that is marvelous and uh, it leads to my question. If there is the possibility, and if you actually do that, to train a new generation of collectors, I think there's a lot of education that has to take place in that level. I'm talking as a, a mid-30s, late-30s person, and there is a generation of, of Africans with a lot of money, and the issue is um, convincing them that building up a collection that kind of entails or embodies their culture is something necessary to do uh, instead of spending the money on some uh, other goods of ostentation, uh, be they cars or whatever, that they should uh, put a channel that money into building uh, an intelligent collection. So do you also do workshops to train young people in collecting or convincing them to collect stuff? Well, unfortunately, you don't train collectors. Collectors um, come out of um, having passion, interest in uh, art, artworks, and then they use their scarce resources to buy. But I'll tell you one thing that is happening. There is a follow, follow, I mean, I call it follow, follow, a kind of um, emulation, emulation instinct in Nigerians. I can assure you that in the past few years, my activity as a collector has influenced a lot of collectors who want to be like me in promoting Nigerian art. Not only that, um, in Nigeria right now, I organize, um, uh, I do a lot of um, uh, donations. For instance, I've just donated a 15 feet bronze work to the Faculty of uh, Law in the University of Lagos. And it, gave, it had a lot of um, national coverage. I can assure you that in the next few, a few months, there will be one person trying to be like me. You see, you've got to lead by example in terms of collecting. Once you lead by example and people see value in what you are doing, um, and they see you know, a lot of benefits uh, that they can derive by virtue of uh, collecting, then you will begin to see um, more, more, more collectors emerging. And then don't forget, there is a problem of uh, religion in my country. I mean, a lot of people will not want to associate with sculptures because they believe it's uh, anti-God, especially when you are a Muslim. And even the, in terms of paintings, you have some so-called born-again Christian who will not touch a painting with um, a 10-foot ten, ten pole because they believe it's uh, anti-Christ. Anti so those are challenges that uh, will uh, make it difficult for um, emerging collectors, I mean, for, for collectors to emerge. But having said that, within that limitation, there will be people that want to be like me, who want to use their resources. There are people who are 100 times richer than me, 
who would rather use their money to do what you said than buying works of art. But I think when they begin to see the value, the value in what a collector can do to influence society and can um, uh, derive a lot of um, international benefit, like being invited here to talk, I mean, I'm sure it's going to be a kind of incentive to uh, other collectors to emerge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prince Bruce. Thank you very much. Okay, one more. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, uh, I, I I'm sorry. I just okay. wanted to add something. Congratulations to the two collectors because I think it's an amazing uh, uh, source and important source of supporting artists to buy their work. And, uh, and in addition of that, to build the collection that is comprehensible and so. I just wanted to make a, 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 like a little footnote to what uh, Prince Yemisi was saying in response to uh, the moderator's question about so-called international artists, be them Nigerians. I think we have to be extremely mindful and careful on not creating these kind of oppositions of so-called continentals and diasporic. And, uh, and I really believe that uh, uh, Artists face challenges everywhere, even in the affluent West. I mean, we should not be fooled and blinded because we move along affluent circles. Artistic practice is still a very challenging field, specifically for artists, wherever they are. So uh, I just wanted to add that that it's not because a Nigerian artist is in London that he is better off than one in Lagos. So Very good point. Yeah, can I respond? I'm not saying... Um, I hope you did not get me wrong. You're getting me wrong. I said I use my resources, my hard-earned resources, to encourage Nigerian artists in Nigeria. And that I think that is the area I have focused on. Others could decide to focus on Nigeri Nigerian artists in diaspora. But within the little resources I have, and the fact that I have access to Nigerian artists, the, I relate with Nigerian artists. I'm a patron of the African Circle of Artists. I'm a patron of the Nigerian Society of Artists. I'm a patron of many art organizations. And there are a lot of demands on me uh, in terms of uh, pro promoting Nigerian art in Nigeria. So it's very difficult for me to spread my resources outside Nigeria. That is what I'm saying. I'm not, di I'm not dichotomizing. Um, art, artists in, uh, outside Nigeria from artists within Nigeria. I'm saying within the limited resources at my disposal, I have concentrated on promoting Nigerian artists in Nigeria. That's the answer to uh, my question. Thank okay. you. And um, Bruce, you wanted to say something quickly last? Yes, I just wanted to say as a South African, it's hugely paradoxical in certain respects that works like the great Jumili Feni, which were acquired by institutions, but were never shown, get shown by countries outside of South Africa. For example, there was the Short Century Exhibition, and it was, um, as far as I understand, in Munich, Dusseldorf, Paris, Chicago, New York. And I saw works that were shown there outside of South Africa that have never been shown in South Africa. So it's almost some kind of acknowledgement that Five exists. rather than inside. Yes. Yeah. You have to start in, I guess. Then you go out. Then you go worldwide. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>